So let me welcome you to this incredible series of lectures, which will no doubt today live up to the standard that has been set of uh, raising awareness of issues that we should be concerned about. The issue of road safety is always very, very near and dear to us. We in the university family lost one of our workers only two weeks ago. It's not even two weeks ago um, when they were parked on the shoulder on the bypass and he was hit by changing a tire um, and was hit. So we, the, the whole issue of road safety has been very fresh in our minds recently um, and we grieve with his family as well. I am going to ask, uh, uh, we're going to go as per the program partially and we are going to have our first greeting from uh, Miss Monica Ladd, an attorney at law. She's representing the American Friends of Jamaica, been a partner in the, was a partner in the law firm Maz Fletcher and Gordon for over 11 years and practicing on her own since 2005. Those of us who have known Monica over the years have known she's very active in just about everything, whether corporate, civic, charitable affairs, serving on a number of boards, and I, Welcome her to the podium to bring your greeting with great pleasure. Thank you, Professor Eldemeyer. Um, Chair, Minister of Justice, the Honorable Mark Golding, um, Ambassador Bridgewater, Reverend Ockard, um, and Professor Scherer, doc doctors, <laughs> Denise, doctors, Leo Ayi. I bring greetings on behalf of the American Friends of Jamaica and Ambassador Sue Cobb. The American Friends of Jamaica is one of the sponsors of this lecture, along with Ambassador Cobb, who is currently the president of American Friends of Jamaica. American Friends of Jamaica is a US-based charity. Um, it is 30 years old this year, and it was established in 1982, largely by a handful of wealthy Americans who holidayed in Jamaica. Um, through their visits, they had developed a deep appreciation for not only the beauty of the island, but also the beauty and the needs of the people. Um, it was established in 82, and since then it, is a, been, it has evolved into a vibrant and well-established US-based charity. Among others, its board of directors currently includes U U.S. Ambassadors Sue Cobb, Glenn Holden, Gary Cooper, Stan McClelland, and Michael Sotiris, um, who recently came off because of health. But what that is is basically all living former U.S. Ambassadors, and it's really quite remarkable that people who come here for a few years remain in touch. and, and through their work and, and in many cases um, through, through, through contributions, give back to Jamaica even though they only lived here many, many years ago at this point. The AFJ has special charitable tax status in the United States so that contributions to the AFJ are tax deductible in the US. Um, through the AFJ, US residents and citizens can make contributions to Jamaican charities and get tax advantages in the US that they couldn't give if they gave their money directly, for example, to UE or to the other things that they give. So they give through the AFJ. Um, in its 30 years of existence, the American Friends of Jamaica has raised and distributed over 12 million US dollars. That's over 1 billion Jamaican dollars in the areas of education, health care, and human and economic development. And close to home, the AFJ part with, with partners Sue Cobb, Ambassador Sue Cobb and Ambassador Glenn Holden and Ralph Lauren, um, the AFJ gives bursaries to students here and Sue Cobb and her family foundation support this lectureship, which is designed to give a, a platform to um, the brightest minds in Jamaica doing the most interesting work into Jamaica's strategic development. Um, 
Several years ago, Sue and her husband Chuck established this, this lectureship, and it's in what, about the sixth year or something. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's, it's really worth noting that it's not, it's, it's not it, it really is designed to get Jamaica thinking and talking more about where it's going at, a, at the highest level. And I think that kind of an investment by a foreigner in, in our own sort of intellectual thought is, is really remarkable. Um, I, like everyone else, um, bring a, uh, extend apologies from Sue Cobb. She called me today. She sounded really very shaken up. She was in an accident which, in which her car wasn't her fault, um, an accident in which her car was totaled. Um, they told her to go to the hospital, and she said, no way. <laughs> she walked away. Um, but she, she, she is OK. Um, and she asked specifically that I extend um, her very best wishes to Dr. and Mrs. Liu Ai, the parents, young Dr. Liu Ai, um, Lisa Lindo, and Ambassador Bridgewater in particular, and to all the rest of you. I'm sure she would have extended greetings to you, Minister, if she'd known you were here. Um, it's an unfortunate way of leading back to the subject at hand. <laughs> it's an, an awkward segue into road traffic safety, but suffice it to say that we look forward to a very interesting and, and, and very useful and timely um, presentation by young Dr. Perry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Ladd. And just let me reassure you, um, and you can reassure the American Friends of Jamaica, that certainly over the years they have achieved what they have set out to achieve. The subject of last year's lecture, which as you know was on marijuana and its uses, Minister, um, that discussion lasted well into the year, in fact, resulting in a publication in WIMJ. Um, so if your objective was to get us discussing the topic, you certainly achieved that. As I have no doubt I'll be able to say next year that you have done the same thing. So, so it's good when, when something that is intended not only brings in some well-needed funds to the university, but then achieves the purpose of academia, which is what it was intended for. Um, and I assure you that we and those such as um, Dr. Lindo, who are responsible for this, ensure that we can't forget it and, and keep on the, the academic side of it as well. Um, it is with great pleasure, you will remember, we had a message from Ambassador Bridgewater last year, and this year we are very, very fortunate to have the Ambassador with us in presence, and I welcome you to the podium to bring us a greeting. To the Honorable Mark Golding, the Minister of Justice, may I congratulate you. To Dr. Lisa Lindo and Professor Denise Eltmere Shearer, to the, all the organizers of the Cobb Lecture for 2012, our platform guest, and of course, Dr. Paris Liuai, who's going to be our guest speaker today, and his proud mother is here, beaming, and father. <laughs> and to the members of the U.S. Mission, uh, my husband, who's just off of a plane and is following me here, so we're glad to have him here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, of course, I'm delighted to be with you this year. And the reason I wasn't last year was because uh, Secretary Clinton decided she wanted all of her ambassadors back for a meeting in Washington. And of course, we know that that had to take precedence. But my heart was with you. May I thank you very much for your kind thoughts about Angela Harvey, whom we miss dearly, and whom I know all of you love, and whose memory will be with us all the time. I, too, got the call from Sue today and was really quite shocked and saddened, uh, particularly when she told me about the, the accident and the subject matter for this evening. But she specifically wanted me to tell you that she really wanted to get on a plane, but thought better of it. And I think all of us agree that she is where she should be today, but she sends her very warm greetings to all of you. The Cobb Lectures, ladies and gentlemen, are a very important contribution to the landscape of discourse and positive action on a variety of issues of importance to both the United States and to Jamaica and to all of our citizens. 
And it is invigorating for me to be back on a college campus, which is where I spent a lot of years before joining the Diplomatic Corps, and it's wonderful to feel the vibrancy of being here. And I'm delighted that former Ambassador Cobb, with the American Friends of Jamaica that she works with now as the president, has established and continues to sponsor this very important intervention in Jamaica in partnership with the University of the West Indies. And I'm also very pleased that the topic this year is a very serious one, and that is of motor vehicle safety in Jamaica. Unfortunately, Jamaica has experienced more than 300 traffic deaths per year for well over the past decade, and you've seen these reports in your newspapers, with pedestrians accounting for over 40% of fatalities. In 2011, the Road Safety Unit of the Ministry of Transport and Works embarked on a 12-month campaign to try to keep fatalities under 300. That goal, as you know, was narrowly missed for 303 people died in accidents in Jamaica in 2011, and nearly 1,000 more were injured. Besides the high toll of lost lives and bodily injures, injuries, Jamaica loses 100 million US dollars annually to traffic accidents in property and vehicle damages, lost wages and productivity for accident survivors, and reconstruction and repair to infrastructure damaged in accidents. At the US Embassy, we are acutely aware of these grim statistics, and we're working aggressively to do our part to prevent accidents. The U.S. Department of State's motor vehicle program restricts drivers to being on duty for not more than 10 hours a day, and less than eight of those may be spent actually driving. In Jamaica, any U.S. government vehicle on official business can only be allowed to travel outside of the cities from dawn to dusk. So for trips to rural areas, everyone, including myself, has to build in an overnight stay if travel is not by daylight hours. All of the embassy's professional drivers have received the world-renowned Smith System driver safety course, and our motor pool supervisor is certified in the Smith System, one of only a few in all of Jamaica. And I'm proud to say that prior to coming out to my previous post as ambassador to Ghana, I took what we call the crash and bind course, which took me around obstacle courses, taught me defensive driving, so in the event my drivers can't drive, I can take over the wheel. <laughs> During our annual award ceremony, one of the most coveted citations at our embassy is that of safe driver. And I'm so proud that we have chauffeurs who have literally driven hundreds of thousands of miles over their decades of service, and they've never had an accident. So it can happen, ladies and gentlemen. So with these few observations, I again greet you very warmly. And in the spirit of road safety and security, wish each of you a wonderful, instructive, and productive evening. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for those wonderful words and, and for providing us with leadership in what some of us can do when we have drivers, etc., around us that perhaps we also should be um, following in your lead. You also reminded us um, of the pioneering work of persons that are in the audience with us, Dr. Jones, Mrs. Fletcher. However, I don't think many people perhaps know why Minister Golding is here. Um, and we cannot have a function that talks about road safety and focuses on the needs of road safety without remembering Professor John Golding. Um, John, as I certainly knew him, is smiling on us today and he's saying, well, better late than never, that we are getting to the point of beginning to give this very important subject. And I'm sure that, that Mrs. Fletcher, in her mind, thinks all these years of, of 
worrying about it and trying to raise and, and Lucian to raise awareness is finally getting somewhere. It's up now onto the to the national calendar. And so we come to that point in the afternoon that we are all here for. Um, and I'm it's my pleasure to ask Mr. Chris Hine, the general manager of NEM Insurance Company, a graduate of the University of Bristol, where he gained honors in modern languages, but we'll convert him into the whole thing of traffic and, and prevention and community activities, and then we'll show him the tent with all of the research activities. So, so he will be part of us before the end of the evening. Um, he is the one who is going to introduce our guest speaker, um, Dr. Paris Liao, and I welcome him to the podium to do so now. <laughs> Professor Denise Eldermeyer Shirley, uh, Shearer, sorry. Excellency Pamela Bridgewater, United States Ambassador to Jamaica. Senator the Honorable Mark Golding, Minister of Justice. I believe Principal Gordon Shirley is expected. Um, it's Monica Ladd from the American Friends of Jamaica, other specially invited guests. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the great honor and privilege of introducing this evening's keynote speaker, Dr. Paris Liao Ai, someone who I've got to know quite well over the last few years in his capacity as director, and technical, director of and technical advisor to NEM Insurance, so he's one of my bosses. Of course, with someone so accomplished, there is a long list of accolades and achievements to tell you about. But before I get to that, I wanted to take a few minutes to share my experience of working with Paris and how effective he has been in bringing his expertise to bear on NEM. As you will hear later, Paris has many strings to his bow, but it was his expertise in hazard mapping and catastrophe modeling that was particularly relevant to us at NEM by enabling us to better understand our exposure to natural disasters paris has brought greater symmetry to our negotiations with our giant international reinsurance partners as we all know jamaica is threatened by catastrophes it sits on the same fault line that spawned the earthquake that devastated haiti two years ago and from june to the end of november every year we all watch nervously for signs of the next destructive storm coming our way. As one of the island's largest property insurers, NEM is right in the front line of managing and mitigating the risks associated with hurricanes and earthquakes. And the key to effective mitigation of these risks is the efficient purchase of reinsurance. Because for the most part, hurricane and earthquake claims will be paid from the capital of international reinsurers rather than the, local, the capital of local insurance companies like NEM. At the core of the negotiation of our reinsurance contracts is the considerable challenge of predicting how often these catastrophic events will occur and how bad they will be when they happen, a process described as being similar to driving on a narrow, hilly, windy road with your windscreen blacked out and only your rear view mirror to guide you. Well, Paris and his catastrophe models have enabled us to interpret the data from the rear view mirror so that we can buy the right amount of reinsurance at the right price. This is the cornerstone of affordable coverage for the Jamaican consumer. Earlier, I used the word symmetry because so often those of us in small companies and small countries are overwhelmed in our dealings with hugely resourced international organizations. Usually there is asymmetry in our respective capacities to research and analyze, and this leaves us very much the junior partner in ensuing negotiations. Paris and his team have closed the symmetry gap for us at NEM by providing data and analysis that is more relevant and accurate than that available to our counterparts on the other side of the table. Recently at NEM, we were very happy to be able to prove that the international catastrophe models that were being used against us were simply wrong for Jamaica. And I personally took great delight in seeing my highly esteemed and respected colleagues from London, Munich, Zurich, concede that our world-class expert, Paris, had detailed local knowledge that was not available to them. 
And at this point, I really would like to congratulate Principal Gordon Shirley and his team at UWI for having the foresight to invest in Paris and his team at Mona Geo Informatics. The Institute... The Institute is truly relevant and effective in helping our Jamaican business on the international stage, and it is a fine example of academic research and development enabling commercial enterprise. And so to Paris' impressive resume. And ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to make yourselves comfortable um, at this point, <laughs> because for one so young, a lot has been achieved. So here we go. Dr. Paris Liao Ai is the director of Mona Geo Informatics Institute at the University of West Indies, which functions as the geographic information systems hub of the Mona campus. He is responsible for overseeing all commercial research and development activities at the Institute, which is one of the university's premier units responsible for, amongst other things, the development of the region's first GPS navigation system, JAMNAV. He sits on over a dozen boards and committees, serving as chairman of the Water Resources Authority and as a director of the National Housing Trust, NEM Insurance, First Global Bank, Management Control Systems and the Jamaica Automobile Association, amongst others. He is the acting chairman of the advisory board of the National Works Agency. I'm not sure if you wanted me to mention that, Paris. <laughs> Paris is the chairman of the National Housing Trust Policy and Human Resources Committee and a member of the Technical Committee. He also sits on the National Council for Science and Technology. Paris is a member of the Crime Observatory and Violence Prevention Alliance, the Urban and Regional Information Systems Association of the United States, and the International Association of Crime Analysts, the Chinese Benevolent Association, the Geological Society of Jamaica, and the Jamaica Geographical Society. He is an honorary fellow of the Unit for Disaster Studies. Is there an intermission? <laughs> his interests span fields in science, technology, and business, and his active research includes natural hazards analysis, crime modeling, Martian rock breakdown analysis, transport systems modeling, and cast geomorphology. Mm. Other interests include terrain signature diagnoses, geocomputational modeling, geospatial planning for businesses, data analytics, GPS systems, virtual reality modeling, and web mapping. He is the co-author of over 30 peer-reviewed books, papers, book chapters, magazine articles, and consultancy technical reports. He is a former Jamaica Exhibition and United Kingdom Commonwealth Scholar, receiving a first-class sorry, first class honors degree, BSc in Earth Sciences from UWI, and a Doctor of Philosophy in Geography from the University of Oxford. Paris is the recipient of the 2004 Prime Minister's Youth Award for Excellence in Academia, the 2005 Youth Musgrave Medal, the 2006 Governor General's Youth Award for Excellence, and the EduVision 2009 Award for Excellence in Innovation. So we have significant awards in 2004, 2005, 2006, and 2009. So that leaves us to wonder about 2007 and 2008. But I'm very pleased to tell you that in 2007, <laughs> Paris got another very, very significant national uh, piece of national recognition. In 2007, the Gleaner named Paris as one of Jamaica's 10 most eligible bachelors. <laughs> and I have no reason to believe that either his status or his ranking have changed since. So ladies and gentlemen, and perhaps especially the ladies, I am pleased to present Dr. Paris Liao Ai, who will now speak to us on the subject of addressing road safety through innovative thinking and technologies. Paris. Thank you, Chriselle. We have to talk later. <laughs> Ambassador Bridgewater and Mr. Bridgewater, uh, Minister, uh, Minister Golding, um, colleagues, 
from MGI, colleagues from my other associations, I see former Deputy Principal Perel here. Um, family, friends, certainly my good friends from Trinidad Law and Hafiz who are here today because they know how nervous I am with public speaking. <laughs> but um, when I was asked to give the, the Cobb lecture and looking at the different um, presentations that have gone before me, and also looking at the theme of Research Day for 2012, looking at health and wellness, um, I have never, I've given only one presentation on road safety before, um, mostly doing stuff on earthquakes or GPS or um, crime. I decided to do something more in keeping with, with um, the theme for Research Day as well as doing something new. The university has, has some new ideas, some new approaches as it relates to um, road safety and the contributions that this organization can make to um, addressing those types of problems. And we're here to look at these types of issues um, in a new way, with a new perspective. And we're going to talk about the different components, the different stakeholders uh, in, 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 when looking at road safety. It's a complex matter. It's not simple at all. Um, there are many issues associated with dealing with the problem, but there are many issues in dealing with collecting data to deal with the problem. Because all of these things have different, occur over different space, occur over different times, have different types, have different backgrounds, contexts, etc. We're going to lead the discussion in towards the development of a methodology that will allow us to cost and model the impacts of crashes and Ambassador Bridgewater gave us some figures a while ago. These figures are extremely important and when you boil them down to local uh, and specific places, Kingston, Crossroads, the, the, um, the area surrounding Carib Theatre, different scales of data that we're going to explore and ultimately cost and model. We can use the past to predict the future to some degree and we're going to develop tools to assist and inform road safety practices, as well as refocus common perceptions on road safety. Now, what's important is that this presentation is not a road safety presentation. This is about methods and approaches to dealing with road safety. This research supports the efforts being done by the Road Safety Unit in the Ministry of Transport, Works and Housing as well as that of the National Road Safety Council. Our deputy chair is um, Dr. Jones, who's here. Um, managing director is Paula Fletcher, who's also here. Anybody looking for controversy and, and conflict with them, they're not gonna get it this afternoon. These guys do the work. We are just providing a different dimension, a different perspective. Um, <clears throat> and and, and towards, towards supporting the efforts of, of the National Road Safety Council and the Road Safety Unit, but also helping people like Chris and Andrew and other members of the insurance sector, the private sector with interests in um, road safety issues, the media, schools, churches, other organizations with stakes in, um, in dealing with the road safety problem from an organizational level or from an individual level, a community level, and so on. In dealing with road safety, you have to look at the road first, road safety. There are many different types of roads. You have the dual carriageways, limited access highways, or thoroughfares, we have main roads, parish council roads, and so on. And one of the elements of the national road safety policy talks about um, looking at, at um, rationalizing speed limits. This is something that we'll, we'll address um, later on. But different types of roads have different um, implications on how you approach road safety. Different roads have different construction types, whether it's a new road that you're building, upgrading an old road, repairing an old road. The design of the road is important, as are the materials used to construct the road. All of these things vary from road to road. When you look at drainage issues, you have internal drainage, where the road is designed, or poorly designed, and it causes water to pool on the road as a function of road design. Or the road itself is just being cut through a floodplain, or as in the case of the Mount Russell Bypass, an active fault zone. So you have to consider all of those types of issues with respect to um, the road engineering. You also have potholes. But another issue is the matter of painting, the road painting. Roads without lines in them are extremely dangerous, as are roads without signage, proper signage, 
to indicate um, where you're going. These things themselves create hazards. Vehicles themselves are different. You have new and old vehicles. You have vehicles in good conditions, vehicles in poor conditions. And, and, and I, I um, have to emphasize in commenting about the, 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 the case of um, Ambassador Cobb today, I don't think in any small measure that um, her well-being right now is owed to the type of vehicle and the safety measures in that vehicle, which allowed airbags to deploy and other safety features that exist. You have um, antelope braking systems, you have electronic um, traction control systems in new cars, you have radar proximity detectors, all of these things allow and improve um, driver safety when looking at vehicles, um, different types of vehicles. And of course, these different types of vehicles range from cars to SUVs to buses and trucks and many different types of vehicles that are, that are out there. Um, and all of these require different types of um, understanding when approaching vehicle safety. I couldn't resist this. Everybody thinks that they're the stig. And um, the fact of the matter, you have different types of drivers. Um, some drivers are better able um, than others, better trained than others. But in looking at the, the situation of road safety in Jamaica, you see a pattern. What I call own driver. You are the driver, it's your fault, as opposed to another driver's fault that causes crashes. You have broken them down into reckless driving in which speeding is a form of reckless driving, as is overtaking and so on. Distracted driving, cell phone use. You have distracted driving where passengers, kids throwing stuff in the car, distracting you. Cargo, your stuff fall in the car and you look behind and you crash. Impairment, alcohol, drugs, fatigue. These things all factor into um, uh, a driver um, um, condition. Other drivers where another driver blinds you with uh, the full beam headlights. He's not in the crash, you are. It's somebody else, it's another driver's fault. When this driver turns and you swerve, he's not in the crash, but you are. Uh, he stops or he parks his car and flings it anywhere he feels like. It's not your fault, but you crash. All of these things emerge in the database. Passengers also factor in, these guys, want to stop, want to be dropped off or picked up wherever they feel like it. Um, sure, the drivers should know better. In these cases here, the pictures you see, um, not only are they, well in these cases, taxis letting off people, but they're also blocking traffic behind them. Passengers themselves need to buckle up, right Paula? In the back seat too. All, all um, motorbike, motorbike people should be wearing helmets. Again, it comes down to um, enforcement, right police? Pedestrians, they are, they, they are the victims in most of our fatalities. But they themselves put themselves in harm's way by walking three, four, five abreast in the road when there's a sidewalk. This lady on the top left here is walking on the road where there's a sidewalk, but also walking against traffic on a cell phone. And on the top right, you see people crossing Highway 2000. And these, these create conditions where, where again, the, the driver who's, who belongs on the road have to deal with people who don't belong on the road. And we should be able to, we, we need to look at the education of these people as well. Other users factor into this thing. Yes, everybody likes to blame the National Water Commission. Sure, and they deserve it. When they dig up a road to fix a main and leave it. As you can see on the bottom right, but you also have street and sidewalk vendors. Sidewalk vendors occupy space on the sidewalk, forcing pedestrians to walk into the road. You have cars stopping to deal, um, deal with these sidewalk vendors and street vendors, blocking a line of traffic behind them. These street vendors are standing up in the middle of the road. You have, the, you have animals, top left. You have goats, cows, um, donkeys, all these stuff in the road that create hazards and dangerous driving conditions. But I don't know who's worse. The animals are the people who dump garbage in the road, forcing you to swing out. These garbage end up in our gullies, our drains, blocking those gullies and drains, forcing water to come onto the road. So again, you have conditions that are not necessarily driver issues or road issues contributing to a compromised road safety uh, condition out there. Enforcement, you have 
issues dealing with motor vehicles that shouldn't be on the roads, that are on the roads. You have, I, I mean, I know certainly from the point of view of the general insurance industry, we are very careful about uh, insuring vehicles that are brought in, but as well advocating against importation of used tires, among other things, um, which would compromise vehicle safety. We need to talk about making sure our drivers are properly educated with the more up-to-date, um, about up-to-date um, vehicles. We need to identify and penalize traffic violations as well as to collect the fines and prosecute those who don't pay. Overloading is important. We have been putting way stations in Harborview and Agualta Vale, among other places in Jamaica. But again, overloading is a very serious issue. It's not just about compromised vehicle condition or whatever, but these overloaded vehicles destroy the road. Have you seen St. Thomas? Those roads are from overloaded vehicles where the, um, the trucks are digging up the roads because of the excessive weight. But we must also look at quality control of our actual road construction. You don't want to fix a road and in six months' time it's gone because the material for that type of road, for that type of condition, was poorly selected. We need to carefully select our contractors, something that's important in ensuring the quality control of the work and the expenditure that's done in there. And we must look at anti-corruption in everything. And this is, this is the thing that's always in the news, always topical, but, nobody, but people need to do something about it. And of course we have, again, rational, we need rational speed limits. Limited access roads with 50 kilometers limits is kind of silly because this road is the um, Florizel Highway Road heading towards um, Rockford, 50 km speed limit, which is the same speed limit as Mona Road, which is the same speed limit as Gardenia Boulevard, which is the same speed limit as other minor parochial roads. We need to, t we need to take a look at, t at rationalizing speed limits, but when you look at the top, the middle, the middle picture, I don't know what that speed limit is because it's been duct taped out. So we have these things going on out there, and, um, and those police arrest me whenever I can't read that sign. And I'm not bashing the cops, because at the end of the presentation, I, I become your friends again, so don't, don't hang off me yet. But this was in the papers on Saturday. Traffic cops not leading by example. We have different um, comments inside of this, talking about um, traffic cops are not sincerely in the business of reducing speed, blah, blah, blah. Um, so many policemen in unmarked vehicles on our roadways, blah, 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 yet not doing anything about it. Presence of law enforcement is just not felt on our roads. And if we are to curb this problem and improve the quality of driving on our roads, all personnel, police personnel need to play their part and not just those on the beat. We can't have cops looking at solving or, or, or dealing with crime situations or preventing robberies and at the same time ignoring a traffic violation right in front of the building. So this was the challenge. We got the data from Road Safety Unit. Over 75,000 crashes were provided to us, and we've mapped 62,000. We've actually gone closer to 65,000 right now. This is ex an extremely difficult task. When you have misspellings like Hope Road being spelled H-O-E-P Road, that's easy and simple to fix. But when you have references to Eltham Park, or is it Waltham Park? or Bogue Road, or is it Bogle Road? It becomes very difficult to figure out which one are you talking about. And we have to go into the accident report to find out. And we find out, but it's extremely time consuming. We have incorrect dates in the database. 2025, 2028. I'll be, I'll be what, 48, life spare, um, in 2028. I was not alive. I don't know how many cars were in Jamaica in 1900. But we have unclear descriptions in the database as well. We have a long top grove placed near the Iron Gate and in the vicinity of the clock. <laughs> and these make it very difficult for us to filter through um, 75,000 points in the database uh, and, 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 and moving through. So in other words, um, members of the police who at the police station who have to record this information need to understand that this data goes somewhere and is very important. And, member, and people who do um, road safety analysis don't need to just count the data. Um, you need to actually go a little bit deeper. And when you go deeper, different patterns emerge, like that. That's 65,000 points across Jamaica, 
fatal crashes account for 3.3 percent of the total crashes in Jamaica. And Paula reminded me earlier, and it's important. It's something that I will re-emphasize over and over again in this presentation. There's a big difference between fatal crashes and crashes in general. You have major, severe injuries, minor injuries, and those that have just um, property damage only. And those account for nearly three quarters of the crashes. These are where nobody dies, nobody's injured, but they tear down a stoplight, uh, tear down a uh, stop sign, tear through somebody's wall, break off the bumper, mash up themselves on a sidewalk or whatever. Nobody is dead, nobody is hurt, but they account for 70, nearly 75% of the crashes in Jamaica. As you can see from the pattern, these are along our major thoroughfares. And it's to be expected these areas handle the most traffic. Um, they, have, they, have, um, they have the capacities to also handle the most traffic in most of these areas. So the probability of crashes are obviously um, there, um, much greater in these places, not to be surprised. In looking at different details of the crashes, you see that rear end accidents, crashes, account for nearly one quarter. These are the tailgating uh, incidents. These are um, uh, accounting for uh, about a quarter of the crashes. Um, but the pattern on the top right for the, for the Jamaica is in that graph. But when you look at the individual parishes, you begin to see that in different parishes you have different patterns. In, in St. Andrew, um, rear end crashes account for the most, whereas in St. Anne, head on crashes account for the most. And, and local variations explain these things. We'll go into that in a few minutes. You can break these down by result of the crash, whether it's fatal, minor, serious, or whatever. You can go into the details of the crash by parish. You can do the same information by community, by road segment, and so on. When we look at crashes over time, we obviously see patterns emerging. Some areas improve over time, some areas get worse. But traffic movement and crashes by definition are dynamic, and it's a very difficult thing to, um, to capture. But it does serve as a basis to see what are the effectiveness of road safety efforts over time. And we can look and track um, success by just simple statistics, or you can isolate to particular areas that have um, a greater uh, impact. So if we were to look at 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and so on, you see that the pattern is pretty much similar along the main roads, etc. Uh, and we go and explore this in a little bit more detail. And we had a lot of problems with the 2003 data sets, and we are still working on that one. Um, which is as a res result, 2003 is unnaturally low, but we're still processing that data set. Um, but again, if you look at the national um, figure from 2000 to 2009, and you compare it to the individual parishes, you see different patterns. Some areas have gotten better over time, some areas have gotten worse over time. And again, this is something that the experts in the road safety unit or in the, the, the general insurance actuaries or whatever can use this information to program um, their different activities. So I arbitrarily selected 2009 versus 2000. And of course, I can do year, I can do periods or whatever. And some areas, and this is by community, um, some areas have gotten really bad over that period, some areas have gotten much better. Um, in the case of Delacree Park, only one crash was, was mapped for 2,091 in 2009, 9,000% increase, whatever. But um, you're able to do this type of analysis at individual community level and, um, and take it from there. But more importantly, I want you guys to look at the bottom right, looking at the communities with the most crashes and how that has changed or not changed over time. For the first three years, halfway tree, um, had the was the community with the most crashes. But for the last six, it was central downtown Kingston. And again, we go into the separation between fatal crashes, Paula, and, uh, and just crashes in general. Crashes have multiple causes. Crashes have multiple results. Crashes have different details. And we will explore these. Again, own driver issues resulted in nearly 90% of the crashes that we mapped. Um, and of course, this dominated the distribution um, across the 11-year period that we studied from 2000 to 2010, 2000 inclusive. 
um, driver accounted for the nearly 90% of the crashes. A fatal crash does not necessarily mean one fatal crash, one fatality. One fatal crash can have multiple fatalities. Um, and again, the, the yellow dots show um, single fatality crashes, but the red dots show where crashes amount to more than one, all the way up to, in some cases, over 20, crash, 20 fatalities um, at that location. Um, in, in the case of fatal crashes, the own driver accounted for nearly 70%, and pedestrians accounted for 24.1%. Um, These are pedestrian-caused crashes. Tailgating, following too closely um, from the vehicle behind, following too closely behind the other vehicle, accounted for 22.7% of all crashes. They're the number one cause of crashes. Um, and not staying within your lane and improper overtaking accounted for number two and number three in our list. Excessive speed was number six. Cell phone was dead last at number 31. But remember, this period goes back to 2000 before cell phone proliferation really came up. And again, we can do year on year, month on month type of analysis. But this is the analysis of the 65,000. Um, and again, it should be emphasized that for fatalities, speeding is number one cause for fatalities. Um, but fatalities account for 2,000 of the 65,000. And those are the, the variety of driver cars crashes. So many different types of um, issues, ranging from learner driver, to cell phone use, to losing control, to fatigue, to swerving, to speeding. Many different types of, uh, and categories of um, driver cars crashes across Jamaica. When you take out the driver component and look at everything else, a different pattern emerges. Uh, in most parishes, pedestrians are involved except for St. Anne, St. Mary, and Manchester, where road conditions were to blame. Here we can talk about construction activities, we can talk about potholes, we can talk about many different, but it's road related that dominated these parishes, not pedestrians. By roads, we've looked at individual crash location, but we can also isolate roads, particular road stretches that are uh, of particular nuisance, come up a lot. We can look at the main road network. Because this is a general reference, people can talk about, yeah, that's the um, Mandela Highway, that's the, um, the Junction Road, and so on. But when we go to the road segment, we can actually isolate Money Corner on the Junction Road. We can isolate the Central Village stretch along Mandela Highway and get to much more specific detail to find out, is it engineering in this particular area that will solve the problem? Is it enforcement that will solve the problem? What's going on in that particular stretch in front of Rear Nevy along Spanish Town Road? Um, and determine what to do. But we do both. Looking at crashes across the main road network, the red areas isolate Spanish Town Road, um, the, the, the um, airport road, Junction Road, Mandela Highway, these areas pop up, sure. But in looking at road segments, and Ambassador Bridgewater was discussing with us before um, we began this evening, the menace that is Mount Russell. And Mount Russell is that big red thing in the middle right there, that's Mount Russell. That stretch is the most um, deadly stretch, not deadly, well, crash prone um, stretch in Jamaica. But again, you can isolate different segments in the inset map of Kingston, which particular stretches within Kingston are particular prone to crashes. By main road, there's a four kilometer stretch between Ocho Rios and Aroca Beso that have had 1,169 crashes over the past, past 11 years. 11 kilometer stretch on Harbour View, the Harbour View main road, accounting for 889 crashes over that period but by individual road segments. There's a 5.8 kilometer, 5.8 kilometer stretch. Um, that's the Mount Russell. This is, and this is, this is the uh, ending up in Faith Spen. They have had um, 412 um, crashes in that, in that segment alone. Ewerton, Spanish Town Road, Constance Spring Road, all factor highly in segments. You can isolate Constance Spring, uh, in Constance Spring Gardens, 109 meter stretch, that's how, that's how narrow we zoomed in 
on the road on, on the road segment to isolate that particular stretch. 109 meters, 121 crashes over um, one crash per meter of road in that particular area. When looking at fatalities, we can again look at the main road and we can look at isolated road segments. In terms of main road, Central Village, Mandela Highway, um, 34 fatal crashes, followed by the Old Harbor Main Road, 29, and Harbor View, 28. But by road segments, U-turn pops up. Seven fatal crashes along a four kilometer stretch, followed by a 1.5 kilometer stretch in Discover Bay, and a 496 meter stretch along Spanish Town Road. Six fatal crashes along that stretch. 502,000 road segments were analyzed, of which 20,000 had at least one crash, and um, 1,820 had at least one fatality. Among road factor crashes, 80% were related to skidding. And skidding is not necessarily a speed factor. Road surface materials and road construction type played a very significant role in that. 11% were attributed to potholes. And obstructions in road and road construction activity also factored in significantly in contributing to crashes. When we look at crashes by communities, these things give us very good reference points for stakeholders and people to deal with um, the issues. Communities or constituencies or parishes or however you want to define it have mayors and MPs and councillors and neighborhood watch people who can take ownership for an initiative within those boundaries. But where are the boundaries? And we can isolate those types of issues as well. 839 communities in Jamaica, those in gray are those that have not had a crash over 11 years. You can see those communities through which main roads pass, oranges and reds and so on, more intense colors. And where fatal um, crashes have occurred. In terms of crashes, Halfway Tree has had the most, 2,477 crashes in Halfway Tree, followed by Central Downtown Kingston, 2458, and Constant Spring, 2124. Runaway Bay has 45 fatal crashes, followed by Ocho Rios and Central Village. Now, Central Village had um, a greater percentage of its crashes being fatal than Ocho Rios, um, but... Um, Runaway Bay still had the higher number. 829 communities were factored in. 726 of them had at least one crash. And 454 had at least one fatality. In terms of other statistics, Central Downtown Kingston had the most pedestrian-related crashes. Ocho Rios had the most passenger-related crashes. Spanish Town, the bicycles. Faith Spen, road factor. Halfway tree, property damage only. Halfway tree, turning crashes. And runaway bay, environmental related. Animals, rain, that type of stuff. Um, runaway bay had that. Now taking this to the next level, we've begun to look at developing numerical models as a precursor to spatial modeling. This allowed us to go into something, Dr. Witter, uh, I'm sure that you and I need to talk about something like this because we're now going to calculate the costs of crashes. But we want to factor in the human costs, the injuries or fatalities. Was it, did the driver kill himself and himself alone? Did he kill other people? Did he kill, were there other people in the car? Um, was anybody injured? How severe? Um, how much um, primary care uh, and after, after care will he require? Direct and indirect costs. Property costs are obvious. In some cases, the, the insurance costs of um, calculating damage, etc., litigation fees, all those things. But location costs is where we come in. Some areas, after mapping 65,000 crashes, can be designated black spots, hot spots, 
This is something mentioned in the road safety policy. The identification of roads of, of, of road black spots is something critical. Rural and urban have have severe um, implications on the model, um, and these things are going to be factored in. Whether it's measurable, quantifiable, or immeasurable qualitative data, this stuff can be factored in. And so we've begun developing numerical models to figure this out. I'm not going to bother you with all the Greek, but this leads to a schematic that we're developing, and this is your eye exam. Don't worry, I'm not expecting you to read all this stuff. I'm just showing you how complicated it is. And it gets worse. This is simple. But in looking at the different factors surrounding the human component, and the property component, and the location component. All of this leads to the development of our cost for crashes, individually and collectively. When we reach 75,000, I'll show you the results. But this is a shameless plug for our, our navigation system, and it's not quite shameless, considering the fact that those of you uh, who use the system may or may not know that we've factored in safety in this thing. We've factored in crime areas, crime hotspots, Dr. Ward. We've factored that into the model. So the, na the navigation system will not take you through automatically into crime hotspots. You, you don't know that, it, but trust us, it, it, it's, it's programmed that way. We're also, we will be programming in crash hotspots into, into the navigation system as well. But we've already programmed in speed alerts into the navigation system. The same function that allows us to determine how long it will take you to get from point A to point B has a speed component in there and we now have a pop-up that tells you you're exceeding the speed limit. It's very annoying and I turn it off sometimes but it's, it's, um, <laughs> it's, it's there regardless. Um, the Jamaica Automobile Association is a partner with us and they, these as automotive service providers, again, are important stakeholders. These guys are the people who are advocating the international decade of road safety. Is that correct? Uh, and, and, and this is something that is very important. But a pleasant surprise was the endorsement that we got unexpectedly from the Combined Disabilities Association, where visually impaired people have actually applauded us for the navigation tool as a walking device for them. They now know which road they're on without anybody helping them. So, at the end of all of this, who cares? I'm a works overseer for the public um, National Works Agency parish office in Portland. Uh, my job is to fix the potholes and to maintain the roads. It's not my job to give people tickets. It's not my job to insure them. I'm a policeman. It's not my job to fix the pothole. I'm the insurance man, like Andrew and Chris. It's my job to give you insurance and to, and to set, settle your claims. Not their job. I'd love to see Chris fix the pothole, especially after that introduction. But um, it's not their job. But all of these guys have a role to play. All of these guys can use information like this. We're talking about the people in the road sector, the people, road sector, the engineers, the traffic planners, the road maintenance people. The policy people like Paula and Lucian and um, Canute, all of these guys can use this thing. But of course, you have the MPs and the councillors who have a role to play. They can do something about it. People block road because they, they want justice, because the pothole mashing up the car, blah, blah, blah. You have, a, you, have, you have a leader who can advocate and do stuff with information like this. You have the private sector. Sure, the insurance companies are there, but also I know Mike Webster is here from the Adjuster, Adjusters Association. You have automobile repairers, you have service providers who have a role in this thing as well. The media, schools, churches, driving schools, activists and advocates also have a role and can use information like this. Everybody will be talking about the same thing. The information is now that much more granular and you can go into it and do whatever you need to do with it, but it's there. So ultimately, everybody knows his, his or her part, forgive me. Um, and everybody plays his or her part. But there are many different parts to play. And I picked on the police earlier. But here at the top left, you see an example of a car who was trying to turn right from the left lane. And that police car stopped him right there on the spot. This bus was stopped right at the lights, but stopped waiting for people. 
and the police, this police lady on the bike came up and told him to move. You can't park your bus right there. That's, that, that is what um, enforcement also means. But you also have people, pedestrians, crossing the road at a crosswalk when the, the little man is green. Not any old place where they feel like crossing, which is what they pretty much do most of the time. So it can work. We just need to make sure everybody um, gets on the same page and we're all dealing with the same thing. Thank you all very much. I really want to acknowledge my colleagues at the Institute, um, Lisa, John Mark, Luke, Jenny, Shauna, Hank Hedge, I know Walter is here. All of, all of, all of my colleagues played a very important role. I'm just, taking, I'm just standing up here taking credit for it, but these guys mapped 65,000 points, and that was pretty brutal for them. Um, thank you all very much. It was an honor, and uh, I'm really happy to have been here. Um, thank you. I think you will agree with me that that was wonderful. And I suspect that if we had heard Ambassador Bridgewater, Principal would have to be shuttling us all home because we certainly wouldn't be leaving here. What did you say after 6 p.m.? Principal, there'll be no more night work. We, can't, we have to travel only in the day. <laughs> um, I th think, as you say, and um, he will take a few questions. Um, there are some mics. Well, I see one. I'm not, the light is, yes, there's one mic there. So if we have any comments or questions, don't be shy. Yeah, I can hear you, but. Thank you, Dr. Paris, for your comments. Some years ago, the Gleaner reported Special Sergeant George Jackson, head of the Special Constabulary, that he was lamenting the fact that the police were being promoted on the number of tickets that they wrote. And he suggested that that was wrong, that it was inviting corruption, and it was enabling the police to focus not on the dangerous and careless drivers, mm -hmm. but on the more safe drivers who are doing 60 kilometers in a 50 uh, kilometer zone quite safely. Has anything changed in that regard? Well, I'm one of those who got ticketed for going, doing 60 and a 50, but um, um, so I, I'm with you. Um, and that was the essence of the article that, was, that I showed you, the excerpt from early in the presentation. Uh, I hate to defer because this is, that is not my area of expertise. <laughs> And I, I, it's out of my depth, and I will not even venture to give you a personal opinion on all of that. I can tell you offline and bleep it out, but um, um, that's, that's not for this discussion. But would you suggest that there's a difficulty with the fact that the, all those tickets are being uh, collected, handed out? Mm -hmm. In fact, even the Minister of Finance last year, I think, was having this in his budget as a means of collection. Now, the police officer is viewed more as a tax collector mm -hmm. than a serious enforcing agent, mm -hmm. and therefore it lends to a disrespect for the regulations, yep. especially where you have traffic uh, limits, speed limits, mm -hmm. that are so ridiculously low that it, in, it, it causes the drivers to disrespect even the police vehicles and, uh, and the police are extremely important. In fact, I think worldwide research suggests that effective policing is the number one effective ne means of being able to control mm -hmm. traffic agents. Now, if, if the police are being in, in invited to control traffic speeds that are so ridiculous that nobody respects it, yeah. that is a serious problem. A joke, Would you yeah. agree? Um, I mean, one other thing, I'll comment on that. I mean, uh, it's an observation again. I just believe that police really shouldn't stand up in the middle of the road and tell people to pull over, because if they're really speeding, they'll get run over. So again, again, those are those those are practical stuff to direct to them, <laughs> but um, but but not for me to comment on that. Please, thank you. Doctor, uh, some time ago. Um, Charlemont Avenue in Kingston 6 was mm. a raceway. Yep. And they constructed three sleeping policemen. Mm -hmm. 
I believe the correct word is speed bumps, mm -hmm. yeah. which has significantly reduced that activity. Um, I noticed in the capital of the Bahamas, Nassau, they use it extensively to reduce. What are your views that we should um, think about that? There are, there, in, in terms of controlling speed limits, absolutely. But there was one, and this was something I did not include in this presentation because it was actually a failed um, experiment on my part. Uh, I was trying to look at the number of motor vehicles in Jamaica against the, the total road length in Jamaica against the speed limit. In other words, I was working on the assumption of if you don't do something about and rationalize those speed limits, you're going to get absolute gridlock if everybody travels at, the, at or below the speed limit unless we reduce the number of cars that are coming into Jamaica or we increase the capacity of roads to, um, to deal with it. Um, speed, li um, speed bumps in those particular situations would cause um, a reduction in average speeds, but it would also create increased, uh, reduced traffic flow. Okay. And that's a problem that we talk about. When we look at the issue of Washington Boulevard, we have increased the capacity of, those, of that road to deal with traffic in the mornings and evenings and so on. But there are other issues in terms of allowing and, and facilitating um, free flow of traffic in areas where you can't expand. Um, out wide, wider. Okay. And um, unfortunately, again, this is anecdotal because my experiment failed. I, I over parameterized it. Um, it may cause and contribute to increased um, gridlock. Okay. Uh oh, police come. Good afternoon. Turn everyone. around and ah, good evening. hands on my head. <laughs> well, actually, I just come to clarify a certain um, um, things that were said. But because mm -hmm. if I am Sergeant M. Bennett from Police Traffic Headquarters, you're representing my Hables, um Senior Superintendent, Mr. Radcliffe Lewis, who couldn't make it this evening. But first, if you were ticketed for traveling at 60 in a 50 zone. That's wrong. The first stage is 66. If you have to be going 66 and over to be prosecuted for speed. So if you get such a ticket, money. if you get such a ticket, <laughs> if you get such a ticket, kindly return it to traffic headquarters where the senior superintendent <laughs> have the power to cancel that ticket. Okay? This too okay, can't take it because that, that, wouldn't be, that wouldn't be legal. So okay. that would be wrong. <laughs> and the matter of police officers getting promotion for a writing ticket, that is really a faulty thing. There is, I don't know about that. I'm in the force for 12 years. I work at police traffic headquarters, mm -hmm. and I've never been told about that. So I think I would say that is something that he said it is misleading, and I don't think it is true, and we need to, 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 to know that it is not so. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. That's basically the two things that I need to clarify. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and for the record, um, the, we have worked very well with the traffic police in terms of getting information from them. Because also, Paul, as you were informing me a while ago, they also maintain a, a, a record database with respect to reported crashes and so on. Um, but as you can see in my, in my presentation of the different stakeholders, the, the role of the police and the other, uh, other um, government people in enforcing is a very important matter, but we also need to make sure that all of your colleagues, Sergeant, are on the ball with this as well. Sharon. Yes, Paris. Uh, do you have any demographics on the, um, the pedestrianized crashes? Yes, we do. Um, all, of this, all of this information is in, the, is in the system. None of this data, I mean, all of this data exists already. The only mm -hmm. thing that we've done with it is tease out the spatial component, the mapping yeah. of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In other words, you can still look at the demographics. You can look at the male-female age breakdown of these. Mm -hmm. of these. The, report, the, 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 the database is massive, uh, and we just focus on the addresses and then look at the typologies inside of them. We can look at male-female. We can look at young-old. We can yes, look at Yes, it would be interesting to establish I'm the age. I'm sorry? The age. We the age uh, groups involved. No, we didn't look at we didn't look at um, age. Not for this presentation, at least. All right. All right. It can be done easily, though, Sharon. I mean, yeah. All right. I can give you right now afterwards. <laughs> Hi, Monica. Hi. I would like to know what use do you think this information should be put to? Where do you think are the most crying needs, or, or who do you hope takes this information and runs with it? Um, the the. One of the things that we really do, in, in terms of whether it's crime, Dr. Ward, or hazard data, whatever, we have the information. 
we really try to get people to see what information exists and let them figure out what to do with it. But this is not a cop-out. But you have, again, insurance people know what to do with this data. This can be plugged into their, with their actuarials um, to, to begin to factor in how do you properly um, calculate um, underwriting or dealing with claims, etc. The road safety policy people can certainly use this information. One of the issues in the road safety policy document talks about the identification of black spots, and we have identified the black spots. Um, you can talk about the national work stations people using this information. And if you look at potholes, and this is, a very, this is an issue um, that has plagued me for a little while. Have you noticed the potholes, whenever they patch them, they spray paint the date on it? That's to tell them, help them know when this thing was fixed. But the only way to know when it was fixed is actually physically go there and stare at the ground. It's not GPS mapped. It's not, there is no um, cross-reference that can be used um, to determine frequency of patching. Frequency of patching and correlation with crashes would be very interesting to, to tease out again. And they could use the same information differently. But it's up for them. I can't push this onto them. And, um, but obviously, the information is there. And then researchers can use this information in so many different ways, economic calculation of, 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 of cost of crashes and so on. All of these can be done in ways I can't even imagine right now. But 75,000 crashes will be mapped by March and have fun. It was a very good uh, yeah. presentation, so Paris. Thank you. I have a concern, though. As a road user, mm -hmm. I go from Kingston to Trelawney very mm -hmm. often. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yes, and um, I notice right at Angel's Plaza, mm -hmm. that's a very awful um, I could spot them. there, yeah. as well as right at the pier at Runaway Bay. If you do not know what the road is like, mm -hmm. you're prone to you know, an accident. Right. Um, I'd like for you to do something about this. You didn't really mention. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Um, if, if, if you don't mind, what was the issue at Angels? Is it, is it signage on the road? Is it road marking? Marking as well as that um, roundabout. Uh, yeah. They cleared it in the Christmas. Uh-huh. But at one point, you couldn't see. Right, right. You know, so markings and, and, and signage markings, is important. Yes. Noted. And um, Runaway Bay, what was the problem? There's, well, let me not call any name, but the pier, yeah. the marking. There's a flat median, uh -huh. so to speak. Mm -hmm. And trust me, if you don't know the road, mm -hmm. it can be very fatal. Discovery oh. Bay. Yes. Discovery Bay. Yes. Okay. I mean, I mean, these are these are Sorry, things. It's Discovery Bay. And again, shameless plug. I mean, these are things that we have factored into Jamnav, but um, but we have we have um, from again from my own involvement, whatever you want to call it, with Works Agency. That's something that we we, we will look at. Okay. And um, okay. final question: mm -hmm. Where can I access this information? Um, give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, the okay. information I think is very useful for practicing mm -hmm. engineers and um, some of the design decisions that engineers use in deciding the, um, the design for the road mm -hmm. is this e economic savings that can be gained by the use of the road. Now in the past, I would say 10 years, possibly over the time of your research, we have had a lot of um, new roads being constructed mm -hmm, mm -hmm. along the north coast going mm -hmm. up to Port Antonio. Yeah. And I recall there was a, um, a criticism of the Port Antonio leg yeah. that didn't allow high enough speeds yeah. because of the, um, the, 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 the nature of the yeah, terrain. The terrain yeah. um, have you been able to factor, or can you factor in the economics of the road users mm -hmm. against the level of um, you know, the, the accidents and, and cost of those accidents. I mean, part, well, part of the controversy, and again, the, the, that is segment three you're talking about, yes. North Coast mm. Highway segment three. Um, part of the problem was, was cost at that time, and it was engineering of how you create the, the cuts Correct. to straighten the corner. It was an issue, and I'm sure you're also aware of the, the auditor general's comments about that segment as well, but um, that's controversial. So in other words, um, um, Corners were cut in other ways, and that's, that resulted in the um, in issues with, with with that segment. But 
again, here's a very good example of cost of construction against economic benefit of, of the thing. And you, can, you only look at Highway 2000, and you talk about the entire Highway 2000 development corridor and the type of industrial benefits it will, it will yield and the housing benefits and extending Kingston to the west, blah, blah, blah. But again, these are things that, um, that have to be looked at. And in our analysis, we do see, I'm, I'm talking specifically about, you're mentioning about road construction in the North Coast. And you could see in the analysis the fact that um, St. Mary and St. Anne um, road conditions, road construction conditions factored in heavily in, that, in those particular areas. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mike, how are you? Hi, Paris, how are you? Uh, I was cited in the United States. Um, I was found guilty in an accident. Ambassador's gone, that's okay. And part of the sentence, <laughs> I had to go to driving school. Ah. Why are we not pressing for this? It's an income to the, to the government. The insurance companies well, well, should be lobbying for mm -hmm, this. Mm -hmm. We should be pressing. We should have these people attend schools. Yep. We should see if they can read and write. If not, you take away the license. You know, one of the things, Mike, and again, you have to applaud private sector innovation. You talk about... Um, how, if the government doesn't lead the way, the private sector can innovate its way through. And know that right. NEM has a policy that if you lose your no-claim benefit, you can go to driving school and restore your no-claim benefit. It incentivizes people who have um, um, ha had an accident and they've lost their no-claim and they can get it back um, through by going to going back to driving school. Yeah. And it's, it's a precedent, maybe something we could, you could advocate, follow. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's an, it's, it, you can talk to Chris and find out his experiences, whether people have taken it up, or whether they're insulted by having to go back to driving school or whatever. But clearly it was needed, and it's a benefit to them, and they can take it from there. Yeah, but I'm really talking from the, from the courts. Sure, 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 understood. Yeah. But again, mm -hmm. all, the, 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 the traffic actor, all those type of stuff will have to be admitted. That's not yeah. my area of expertise at all. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. One more question? Yeah, thank you. Yep. Good afternoon again. Sir. Afternoon. Um, I'm from Manchester, so I travel almost every week. I travel, and I notice there have been a significant increase in accidents on Highway 2000. Yep. Have you actually looked at yep. the the and after looking at that, what have you seen where they uh, could actually do some improvements? cutting on speed or something to actually mitigate against this? Right. Um, Highway 2000 is actually pretty well built. Um, and one of the things I should also inform you is the fact that, you know, of course, Highway 2000 is coming to you, right? The, the, the segment two. Um, Maypen to four May parts, Pen, four parts right, to Williamsfield. Yeah. Right. Um, so one of those, and, and again, it's just going to get worse then. Uh, you have to talk about uh, highway patrols in those areas. You have to talk about um, speed cameras or those types of, 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 of devices that you could use to help um, trap speed. There are, the National Works Agency is also testing a new system called speed averaging. What it does, it takes a picture of you at point A and a picture of you at point B. If you, need to, you need to average a certain speed between the two. Not just 50 kilometers an hour when them catch you. Right? In other words, that's a new thing that they will, they will be rolling out soon. But again, uh, it again comes back down to driver behavior, proper, um, proper information. But you, I don't think you'll find a lot of road factor crashes along Highway 2000 because of the design and engineering that went into that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. We, um, yes, I think that everybody should be satisfied. The, the SUCOB um, Foundation certainly has, I think, achieved what it wanted. Monica, it just certainly have got discussion going. There's still more questions. He will be inundated after. Um, the principle and the purpose of Research Day has been to showcase what university does, what is the research contribution in practical terms. And again, I think Paris has walked us through a wonderful discussion of the reality of the impact of research and also what it can do. And just before I call you up, Principal Dr. Jones wants one word. Thank you very much.
Um, just want to, on behalf of the National Road Safety Council, as the vice chairman and as a person um, responsible for coordinating together with my team and the rest of the council for coordinating all efforts. We have a parliamentary mandate which was established in 1993 um, and it is quite significant that the person who started the council, Professor John Golin, late Professor John Golin, his son is the Minister of Justice now and we want to really um, welcome him in that kind of context. Um, and to say that all of the work which had been done formally on road safety in this country was started by the late Professor John Golden. We want to remember him dearly for that um, initiative, among many others that he, he did. Um, <laughs> one of the, the visions he had which became a reality was that the chairman of the National Road Safety Council is the Prime Minister. Every chairman, so the, the former um, Prime Minister, Prime Minister Golden, Prime Minister Hodes, um, and we now have Prime Minister Portia Simpson Miller. All Prime Ministers have been chairman of the National Road Safety Council. So we have access to the highest level of influence in this country. And in that context, we want to thank um, Paris for this wonderful, stimulating, educating lecture which she has presented. We want to thank the, those who have organized the COP lectures, the, um, the friends of the, the American Friends of Jamaica. And we want to thank um, all those who have organized this lecture and to say that we will be using the information that Paris has shared with us this afternoon. And we go further, we have begun to establish a link between ourselves and the university. We are in active discussions with Professor Shirley. We hope those discussions will be a fruit in due course. And certainly this will make a huge difference in terms of the work that we do. Um, we wish you to know that when we started our work in 1993, over 400 people were dying every year in Jamaica. Um, this year, 304 persons died. So we have made some progress. And this work that Paris is doing will enable us to do even greater service to the people in whom, um, who have reposed their trust in us to take this to the different levels that we have taken it. And in that context, we want to thank Paris again for this wonderful lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Jones. And, and I think all of us would also like to give Dr. Jones a hand, knowing he has been that leading light certainly from my profession, in raising awareness about road traffic safety and the role. Principal, may I invite you to make your presentation on behalf of the COP to Paris. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Let me say uh, what a great pleasure it is for me to have the opportunity to present this to uh, young Paris uh, the, uh, for uh, an outstanding presentation. And I think if Ambassador Cobb were able to be here, she would certainly be of a view that uh, Paris uh, has taken a very complex, a very difficult subject, made it very informative, made it very accessible, and I think it, it does all the things that she would have wanted to do. We are, as a university, very pleased that Ambassador Cobb uh, has associated her lecture, uh, the, the Sue Cobb lecture series, with our research the activities and we think uh, it fits in very well. It gives us a chance to showcase one of our um, uh, brilliant uh, young academics. Let me, however, make a, a disclaimer since he has been picking on the police all along. Uh, the University of Western has, a, has an excellent relationship with the police. Uh, we, to the contrary, we're actually thinking about getting him a driver so that uh, he will obey the speed limits. Uh, but but uh, I, I think you can see the, the obvious importance of this kind of relationship. And since this year we are focused on health, if we combine this information, Dennis, with the uh, orthopedic data from the various hospitals, many the orthopedic sections of the public hospitals are among the, the busiest for some of the reasons that he has pointed out. Young boys and uh, children on the road get hit down and... Uh, if we can combine those, I think we will also be able to, to add another layer uh, which will actually be helpful from a health perspective 
even as we focus on, on road, road safety. And Lucian, of course, we hope to advance the discussions in relationship to the collaboration between the road safety organization. So to the point, Paris, on behalf of one of the big um, trailers, the trailer tractors there, the big trucks, um, he carried, they carried oil, petroleum. And so he would come there sometimes on this little narrow road with this huge truck. So he could really manage it very well. But one, and he's always doing chores for the school. So one day I was in a meeting and I heard my secretary saying to him, Mr. You, everybody called him Foodie. Mr. Foodie, you can't go in now. Mrs. Bolt is in a meeting. You can't go. And he said, I have to see her now. I have to see her now. And all that the secretary did, he's, I heard his mouth very loud. So I went out to him and he said, Mrs. Bolt, come here. Come here. I have to talk to you now. Come quick. So I said, what is it? What happened? He said, miss me. going to trouble me. Not trouble. I said, who trouble you? And he said, no Trinity, man. Trinity. So he said, what Trinity do? He said, Miss Bolt, him taking off all of the trailer people them and him testing them. So I said, what kind of test? But you can't drive well, so what kind of a test is he doing? He said, Mrs. Bolt, him testing to see if he can read. <laughs> so I said, so what is your problem? Here, Miss Bolt, me don't know them big words they were asking. <laughs> so I said, what kind of words are you asking? What, what? So here, Miss, big words. Now remember, it's a true thing. I'm telling you, it's not a joke. Big words like car and bus and truck. He said, Mrs. Bolt, me don't know them the word, dear. So I said, then how did you get your license? He said, Lord, Miss Bolt, nobody asked about that. Nobody asked about that. So, Paris, you have some other work to do. <laughs> but friends, I greet you this evening. And I, I thought this was a very unusual but a very rare topic when Lisa told me about it. And this, after, this evening we have come here and we have listened. And there's, we have heard so much about the different methods and technologies that can be applied to road safety. Really and truly something that, that has just sort of broadened my whole perspective on this. We have looked at roads and the vehicles and the drivers and the pedestrians. And so it is hope that on, upon you returning, whether it's home or wherever, back to your places of business and studies, that somehow each person here this evening will be able to reflect on how each of us can contribute to road safety. What it is that we can do to make the difference using all the data. What is certain though is the fact that Having shared in this lecture, this evening, we must share the knowledge that we have gained. And that, the knowledge that we have, has been enhanced and strengthened. That, yes, a little shocking. Because when I heard about it and saw the number of red dots, that sort of frightened me. But remember that most of these dots were caused by speeding. So Dr. Paris, we are immensely grateful to you and we thank you for all that you have shared with us this afternoon and that the, for the work that you continue to do for awakening us to the understanding what's happening in